Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Natalie Gatsi, and I'm the other, well, previous fellow in Act 3. Um, and my work has been on the directed assembly of anisotropic nanocrystals um, and looking at their optical properties. And so then the purpose of this work is that eventually we want to be able to create these aligned nanorod devices because alignment of the nanorods gives us improved control over the anisotropic um, aspect of these rods and be able to give, allows us to enhance their optical properties. And so I'm looking at using aligned cadmium selenide, cadmium sulfide, DAP and rod materials um, for these large scale applications. And eventually one of the applications we're looking at is being able to do something um, with these, op these materials acting as optical waveguides in something like a photoluminescent solar concentrator. So be able to have layers of these well-controlled aligned rods um, and kind of direct their uh, absorption and then also emittance and kind of point towards the photovoltaic cell. Um, and then hopefully we're also working on integrating these with polymers for enhanced structural characteristics. Um, and then eventually, as the goal of this overall REACT project, combine these with the um, something like Ted's work and then also the coatings of Act 1 and 2 to get this multi-layer device. And the materials we're working with, as I said, are these cadmium selenide, cadmium sulfide core shell particles. And the reason we're looking at these is that these cadmium selenide quantum dots can be eas very easily tuned simply by changing the diameter of the quantum dots to emit over pretty much the entire visible spectrum. Um, and as you can see here, going from very small, slightly less than two nanometer dots all the way up to about seven, eight nanometer dots, you can cover all the um, aspects of it. And these materials can also be easily tuned, changing the diameter or going from quantum dots to flat plates, tetrapods, rods, whatever you want. However, um, sometimes in the cadmium selenide materials, they're prone to blinking effects. And um, previous work has found that actually overcoating it with a cadmium sulfide material helps minimize these blinking effects. Um, and you can do this whether it's from a core shell, a uh, nanosphere, or various, once again, tetrapods or elongated structures. And that's what I'm focusing on here, these dot and rod um, elongated materials. And we have a pretty simple synthesis for this. Um, we have our, it's a hot injection method, so we have our precursors, the cadmium source, and these phosphonic acids um, mixed, put at high temperature at which we inject a selenium source. They, it nucleates, grows into um, quantum dots of whatever size we desire. Then we can wash them, precipitate them out, and use them as the base in the synthesis of the nanorods. Um, so now we have very similar precursors, the cadmium phosphonic acid. And this is, phosphonic acid sources are actually very important to get these nice elongated rods. Um, and we inject the quantum dots as well as a sulfur source and the quantum dots act as nucleation points and we have rapid growth of rods over these dots. And once again, we can pull them out of solution, size separate them to get very nice monodispersed samples. Um, and, um, and so using a single size quantum dots, as you can see here, we can grow a vast variety of sizes over them, ranging anywhere from a uh, core shell to san seven nanometer rod, all the way up to almost 120 nanometer length rods. Um, and we can see that you know, just by changing the length, we can kind of see a shift um, in the very strong photoluminescence that we exhibit from these cores. Um, and then we can also change the optical properties simply by changing the initial quantum dot size. Um, and so once we have these rods, you know, as I said, this Act 3, it's these self-assembled materials for energy source generation. So we have two methods of self-assembling them. The initial one is a liquid air interface assembly method where we have the animation's got a little screw up, but we have um, a Teflon well with diethylene glycol in it. And then we drop cast a small amount of a nanorod um, solution in toluene on top of the surface. They don't mix the nanorods, stay on the surface, covered with a glass slide, and allow the toluene to slowly evaporate. And as it slowly evaporates, the rods uh, self-assemble into the most energetically favorable state. 
and by changing the concentration, we can get alignment anywhere from these, as you can see, these uh, horizontal rows of rods up to, it might be a little hard to see, but these are actually vertically stacked rods. So you're seeing the, uh, the dots stacked on the small axis of the rods kind of on its head. And we can get pretty nice, large-ish areas of films, um, micrometer, square micrometer in size. However, an issue with this is that we then have to lift it up off of the uh, liquid, and then a lot of times that introduces cracking or faults in the material. So we're also looking at another deposition method, which is electrophoretic deposition, where we have uh, two substrates attached to electrodes that we um, immerse into a tiny nanocrystal solution, apply a voltage across the substrates, and the charge of the particles drives the nanorods to align on one or, as we'll see, both of the substrates. And with the electrophoretic deposition, we can control a vast variety of parameters to kind of tune our alignment, and these range from voltage, concentration, all those. Um, and we can get very nice ordered layers, once again, the horizontal here, except instead of a mono layer, like we saw with the self-assembly, they're actually kind of stacked layers of the rods, and then we can also get a very nice vertical assembly ones. And so like I said, you know, there's a lot of parameters that were tuned, and a lot of this work was done over the <coughs> summer with the help of Julia, who was one of the French summer students here at Penn. Um, so some of the parameters we looked at is the effect of voltage, where if we didn't apply voltage, just immerse the um, substrates. We saw that there was some deposition, which is to be expected. However, it's very small compared to when a voltage is applied and did not result in any sort of assembled areas. Um, and then as we increase the voltage, we see better assembly up to about 200 volts per centimeter past that. Didn't see much change, so we decided to keep it at that to minimize any potential damage to the rods. Um, similar to with the concentration, by changing the concentration, we were able to change the assembly ranging from 0.2 uh, milligrams per milli, giving more horizontal assembly, to one milligram per milli, giving more vertical assembly. Um, and one of the good things about the electrophoretic deposition, small changes in the concentration, so going from say 0.2 to 0.4, didn't seem to have a huge effect on the assembly here, but it does on the self-assembly. Even a small change in concentration there can disrupt the assembly we see. Um, similar with deposition time, we saw that with increased deposition time, we get better assembly. However, if we keep the um, voltage on for too long, we start to see a degradation of assembly which could be from the either too high of a concentration um, throwing off the rods or potentially degradation of the rods starting to occur. Um, and so while we looked at a lot of these parameters and are still looking into how we can um, improve them, there's a big chunk that we're still not clear about and that's the role of the particle charge on the alignment. Um, most of the reported assemblies have said we measured the charge of our rods, they were positively charged, so we put substrate onto a negative electrode, saw alignment. And, um, so we decided to put substrates on both electrodes, even though our rods were for the most part positively charged, um, and we saw alignment on both rods. And so right now we're still kind of trying to figure out exactly what it is that drives the alignment on both rods. We see that um, we can actually separate charges out so what aligns on the negative electrodes are positively charged rods, what aligns on the positive electrodes are negatively charged rods. But as to why that occurs, we're not sure yet. Um, and then most of these images have all been TM images and we've done the alignment on TM grids, but we're actually uh, working on now aligning on silicon wafers and ITO code glass so that we can be able to do more optical characterization of these films. Such as um, what I'm showing here, where these are films, self-assembled films of four different concentrations. This one was about 15 milligrams per milliliter and trying out darker here than on the computer, but you can see there are some areas of horizontal alignment mixed with randomly dispersed rods. Um, slightly higher concentration gave us uh, very nice bands of horizontally aligned rods. Then we got um, another film that was all vertically aligned and another film that had some vertical alignment, but mostly um, randomly aligned rods, and so we compared, I compared the optical properties of these to in-solution ones, and it's slightly hard to see here, but there is, first there's definitely a broader 
um, peak for the in solution rods, but the most interesting part is that there's actually a slight peak shift from 579 nanometers to, um, for the vertically aligned rods, 584 nanometers or 583 for the horizontally aligned ones. We're seeing that once we have these rods aligned, there is some very good particle interaction that actually causes a shift in the photoluminescence peak. And like I said, once I do the um, similar deposition on um, ITO for the electrophoretic deposition, we'll be able to compare and see if we, for some reason, get stronger um, interaction between the particles for those manipulations. Um, and then we also have a setup in the Kagan lab here at Penn that we're going to start doing where we can look at the polarization of the photoluminescence in these assembled films um, and see how it changes from randomly oriented films to vertically or horizontally aligned films, as well as looking at um, in polymer films, which is what we kind of just recently started working on. So the data we have for that right now is just that we can disperse either the quantum dots or the nanorods in films um, and get very nice dispersed films with no aggregation. But right now we're looking at, can we increase the concentration? Up to what point can we increase the concentration? And the most important thing is gonna be thinking about how can we get aligned films in these uh, materials, which for the most part in, that I've seen for nanorods, uh, these types of nanorods and polymers, they say just by physically stretching, you kind of maneuver the rods to align. Um, but one of the things that we're gonna be looking at is actually work done in Dan Lee's lab that they were able to spin coat a polymer substrate and then spin coat quantum dots on top of it or quantum nanospheres on top of it and see kind of through, as they anneal through capillary uptake, they're able to get a very high loading polymer nanocomposite. Um, and you'll hear much, much more about this later this afternoon, but we're interested in trying these with the assembled films or see if we can get the polymer to kind of uptake between the channels between, say, the vertically aligned nano rods. And this will give us an edge in terms of being able to get these very high concentration, very nicely aligned films. Um, and then one last thing that we are working on is uh, exchanging the phosphonic acid ligands that are on the surface of these rods. They're very tightly bound ligands and necessary for the synthesis. However, it makes it difficult to put anything else on the surface. Um, and so I found a salt washing method that I've been using to be able to exchange that for oleic acid, which is much, much easier to replace. And you can see that it doesn't uh, affect the photoluminescence or any of the optical properties. We only see a very slight dip in quantum yield. So this will be very important. Uh, oh, and we can get very nice alignment with the optical property, uh, the oleic acid rods as well. And one of the things that we're looking at uh, using this for is for my hopefully work in France this summer, um, where we're going to be looking at actually putting on ferrocene functionized ligands onto the surface of these nanorods to be able to investigate kind of the whole transfer properties of these materials. Um, I think I'm running a little low on time. So um, with that, I'd just like to thank my group as well as everybody in React and the collaborators I work with here. And I'll be happy to take any questions. Yes. A quick question. Uh, well, two quick questions. Is this under the, the uh, electro deposition? Was it done under DC or AC? Uh, the electro, it was done under DC field. And do you see any aggregation in the bulk solutions, not just of the electrodes? No, we didn't actually. We did, um, took a couple times where we took the bulk solution and just drop cast on uh, TM grids and we didn't see any sort of um, aggregation or anything. And we were able to actually kind of on the same solution do repeated depositions without any issues. So I mean field induced aggregation in the solution? No, we didn't see it. Thanks. Um, when you were showing the, uh, the peaks mm -hmm. that surface, you, you were showing a slight peak on the left, yes. but also an increase of the uh, yes. of the width of the peak. How do you explain that? Uh, for the the width of the yeah. um so what at least for my uh guess of it is that in so in solution there are there's some um broadness in terms of the size of the nanorods and some of them have um 
kind of small bulbous ends, which uh, you might have seen in the very first picture that I showed with all the different sizes. Um, but what we found is that when they actually self-assemble, any rods that are of slightly different thickness or with go to small areas of, that aren't assembled, well, it seems like the rods that form the very nice self-assembled films um, are the ones that are the most pristine. And so I think that's kind of what's leading to the Problems. Yeah. Yeah. So you mentioned ITO as a substrate. That would be important for either getting light in or the light out. But ITO substrates are pretty rough. Do you know what happens to the assembly on these rough surfaces? So I don't know whether it's the rough surface, but we have found that we do not get as nice assembly. So um, right now I'm kind of working on seeing if we can, if there's something about the parameters that we can shift to get the better alignment, but I'm not sure how well we'll be able to do that. One more quick question. During the drop, cast, drop casting process, have you guys ever tried uh, putting like a capillary or something that sticks up out of the lower solutions to give you a curvature field? Then that can direct the, uh, the alignment of the nanorods over pretty long length scales. I don't know if we've ever tried that. That would be something Interesting to. It might change a little bit the diffusion of the species into the subphase. So that some other things will change the species. Okay, let's see. Now that you want more.